Hi, I'm Chris McIntyre, and this is Almost Above Average. For the majority of my adult life, I was up to no good and was definitely in need of a change. I failed many times trying to change on my own, but it was listening to others that finally got me headed in the right direction. Being able to listen and take advice saved my life, and I'm still listening. I'm seeking out interesting people, stories, and experiences to share with my audience in hopes that you too will learn something to add value to your life. Thank you for tuning in and get ready for another action-packed episode of Almost Above Average with Chris McIntyre. Please share with a loved one and we would really appreciate a five-star review. Thank you and enjoy. Now enjoy our conversation with Dale Pollock, the creative mind behind Set It Off the Book. Chopped. And um, I remember you were telling the story of writing the book. And I just remember I was I was so fascinated by that. And then when I approached you about the book and asked you about the podcast, you were you were very inviting and warm and and I appreciate that. But I want to tell you this little story. When I so you agreed to do the podcast, and I've only done a couple of these things. And so I get home to do my research and I pull up your your catalog and I was intimidated immediately. <laughs> so no it took me a little I know. I mean, I, I know that's not unreasonable, but you have such a body of work that it was it was impressive. When I was reading your Wikipedia, I was like, man, I want, I want mine to look like that. Well, you know, you. <laughs> of course. Kind. So, I mean, I, I had a bunch of things that I was going to try to talk about, but really what I'm interested in, I want to know, you know, who you are, you know, where you came from and how you got into all this artistic stuff that you did. You know, as always in life, it's a long and winding road. So, right. you know, I mean, I had a pretty normal suburban childhood growing up in the 1950s and 60s in Cleveland, Ohio. But Mm -hmm. um, the thing that really changed me was my brother went to Yale and he founded the Yale Film Society. And I used to go up to visit him and they would have a projector set up in their suite and they would watch 16 millimeter prints of classic movies 24 hours a day. (laughs) And that was so exciting to me. And so when I went to college, I went to Brandeis University, which is in Waltham, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. I started Mm -hmm. the Brandeis Film Society. So I I was already inculcated into this idea of classic films are worth spending time with and worth watching. And then when I was in college, I collaborated with two other guys who ran their college film societies. And we actually Mm -hmm. leased a movie theater that we named the Orson Welles Cinema in Cambridge, Massachusetts, not far from Harvard University, about midway between Harvard and MIT. And uh, we did the same kind of programming we did for our film societies. And it was very, it was very uh, popular. And that's what really got me into movies. And, Mm -hmm. you know, at one point, I thought I wanted to be a screenwriter. And after trying to do that, I very quickly realized I didn't (laughs) have that special sauce. So, um, you know, for me, journalism was my way into the movie business. I don't think I really thought of it as that. I mean, I worked at my high school, uh, the editor of my high school newspaper. But when I got hired by a daily paper in Santa Cruz, California, it was an afternoon paper. That was really my introduction to journalism. That led me to my job with Daily Variety, which led me to my job with the L.A. Times which led me to my job working with David Geffen as a development (laughs) executive, which led me to my job becoming the head of a film production company that was owned by a record label, A&M Films. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I was very fortunate and able to make 13 feature films in 10 years. Yeah, there's there's a crazy amount. (laughs) I had a good run for my career. I left feeling Mm -hmm. kind of... uh, on top because I never wanted to be a 70 or 75 year old producer schlepping my script around Hollywood, begging (laughs) for a development deal. That wasn't the fate I wanted for myself. So, um, you know, I was lucky. I was given the opportunity to teach at USC in a graduate program called the Peter Stark program for, for young producers. And Mm -hmm. I was producing at the time. And then I left USC and went to the American Film Institute and co-founded the producing program there that was very successful. And that led me to the University of North Carolina School of the Arts in Winston-Salem, nice. where I have been for the last 25 years. I love that. Was it your older brother that uh, ran the film thing? Was he your yes, older he brother? 
Yep. And that he, sounds he like an older brother type thing. Time about movies. Yeah, that reminds fun. me of my older brother. Like he, I always idolized everything my older brother did, and I tried to follow as much in his footsteps as I could. So that, that's that's funny. Do. And then write, writing for these papers is what led you into to writing scripts for movies. Yeah, and I realized really quickly that that was not my gift. I, no. I, I you know, it's a very particular skill to be able mm-hmm. to be a good screenwriter. You know, the examples of bad screenwriting are all around us. Right. So to be a really good screenwriter is something special. And I realized that wasn't my forte. But what I did have, I think, was a strong sense of story. From having mm-hmm. watched so many movies, and I mean, I've seen close to 5,000 films in yeah. my life and career. I've kept track of almost all the titles I've ever watched. So nice. I mean, I, I'm pretty <laughs> conversant in film language. And yeah. I felt that as a producer, that really helped me because I could relate to writers. I could give them good story notes. So the mm-hmm. fact that I understood story and knew what good writing was didn't mean that I was a good screenwriter, but it did mean that I could be a good producer. Right. Because, you know, if you're a producer, you want to have a strong sense of the story your director and your screenwriter are telling. Because that's right. what you have to believe in to sell the movie, literally and figuratively. 100%. What is the role of a producer in a movie? Well, You're not directing it, right? No, no. And, you know, this is probably one of the misunderstood areas, most misunderstood areas of the film yeah. business. Because producers, there's so many different kinds. So I right. was a certain kind of producer where I found my material. I worked with the writers to develop it to the point where it could get made. I took it out to the studios or the financiers to get it made. And then I worked closely with the writer and the director on any rewrites. So that was my role as a producer, very heavily in development. And then when the film started, I wanted to be on the set every day. Mm -hmm. And that is not to the liking of many directors. (laughs) <laughs> they don't want a producer there every day in their face. Because you're micromanaging them? <laughs> yeah, but it was, I was responsible for the money. That's right. the one thing people forget. There's somebody who signs, whether your budget is $2 million or $200 million. There's somebody who signs a contract that right. says this film will not cost more than $200 million, and you will deliver a 120-minute version of it. Yeah, and you personally that is the producer, and so okay. those those responsibilities are serious, right? And so, so you're I technically was, over the director, then, right? Yeah, because yeah. when it comes to the budget, that's my domain. Right. So okay. you know, I, I have I evolved a certain way of working as a producer. Uh, not mm-hmm. every director liked that. Not every director liked having a producer on the set. I felt I ran a lot of interference and helped directors by taking yeah. problems off their shoulders and putting them on mine. So okay. um, what it gave me, because I was on the set constantly, was a mm-hmm. really good idea of what a good production should run like. Nice. So that was something I was able to bring to the film school, was a certain professional standard, how I thought we had to prepare our graduates so they would really be equipped to go work immediately a major right. film or a TV series. And what I'm proud of how to push, keep pushing everything, right? Yep. And I'm very proud of the School of the Arts. We have a very successful program for Mm -hmm. training producers. And now we have a graduate program that does the same thing, creative producing. That's an NC State, right? I think I think it's just as valuable to turn out good producers as it is to turn out good writer directors. Right. I mean, you can't have one without the other and be successful. Is it usually like writers it, Writers become producers and directors or directors become producers? What's the it's natural progression? It's more like writers become producers and writers. Yeah. That's what's called the showrunner. The showrunner okay. for a series is the writer-producer. He okay. has pretty much, to- he or she has total control because they hire the director to come in and do an episode. But then right. the next episode, it will be a different director. <laughs> so the continuity is in the writer producer. And that's right. why they're really call, called the showrunner. Because you can't run a series without that writer without producer. Yeah, they're the last say, right? They're they're directing traffic kind of and they're directing the director. 
<laughs> exactly. And most directors okay. don't like that idea, but it's a yeah. reality, particularly in television. The director right. has less power in television. Okay. That makes sense. So in a lot of you, you've done 13 of these things. It looks like the 90s were a pretty successful uh, decade for you. Well, I was very fortunate. And that was a time where you could still make low budget movies, movies mm -hmm. under $5 million and see them get a theatrical release. So right. I kind of specialized in that. Almost all of my films were $12 million and under. I only had one really expensive film, and that was Blaze with Paul Newman. And that's because yep. Paul Newman alone was $5 million. So you can't make a low-budget film with Paul Newman because right. the entire budget goes toward his salary. It goes to two actors, right? And the rest is for set and materials. And all exactly, stuff. exactly. So, you know, I didn't really like working with big stars, but you can't get a movie made without a star. So I worked with Newman and Denzel Washington and Shirley MacLaine and Kathy Bates and Kathleen yeah. Turner, all on lower budget films where it was the material that drew them. Yeah. And that's what I got the reputation for, was developing good material that could attract... The actual content of your films, right? That's what they. Right. That's what drew in these uh, big names? Exactly. That's and cool. And so I, I felt I was successful as that. I wish the yeah. films had been more successful. You know, <laughs> it was painful sometimes to think I made a really good film. I did a little movie called The Midnight Clear, which mm -hmm. is Ethan Hawke's second film. Gary Sinise's first film as an actor, Kevin oh, Dillon's man. film. And that film cost four and a half million dollars and it made five thousand dollars. The distributor oh, went belly up. Nobody got to see the movie. I got rave reviews and the film was was in a legal strong box for decades. Yeah. The deals were so messed up. So, you know, that was a very frustrating thing to be able to have a film. Uh, I We thought a script that good, a cast that good, a very good director and a really film that got top reviews and then nobody sees it. You know, so that's Man. kind of the height of frustration. And that's one reason why ultimately I decided to stop trying to produce films and go back to helping young people learn how to make good films and start, <laughs> yeah, there you go. start getting the frustration out of my life and putting <laughs> it into inspiration into their yeah, life. Yeah, into teaching, right? God, right. I can imagine you put all that work and time and you produce the thing. You're probably proud of it. You're probably anxious it's going to come out and then it comes out and does nothing. I can't imagine what that does yeah. to your psyche. It's devastating. It's just devastating. Yeah. And you can't do it that often because you get so um, depressed about right. the process. I bet. I can look back now and know that I made a really good movie. If people watch it now, they agree mm. that it's a really good movie. It's been called one of the best anti-war films of all time. Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg screened it for his entire cast and crew when he was doing Band of Brothers. Yeah. So, I mean, the film is respected. Somebody dug up a recent review on Siskel and Ebert, and they gave it, they gave it two thumbs up. And see? I had never seen that review. So yeah. that was really fun for me to see how much they enjoyed the movie. So, yeah. But, you know, you go through a few of those, and it gets pretty depressing. And that's what really drove me to teaching rather than mm -hmm. doing, because I felt, okay, I had my decade. I made a lot of films. At yeah. least three of them, I thought, were really good. And so now I can leave that behind and go on to my next career, which will be teaching. Yeah. And as most teachers will tell you, it's the most rewarding career you can choose, I right. think. Because you see how your impact on your students has a real effect on their lives. You, right. know? And, you know, so when I have a student who's coming in their first year for film school, and after four years, they know exactly what they want to do and how to do it. That makes me feel just right. as good as making a feature film made me feel. I would argue it probably makes you feel better because you like that impact, at least in my experience, when I know that I've had that type of impact on another person, that is more rewarding than anything. No money, no success or accolades can take that 
take that I way. completely agree with you. And yeah. And so, you know, that was the second part of my career was teaching and loving the impact that it had on my students. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in my third career, which is actually my fourth kind of, which is writing. And right. I'm already at work on my next novel. So I uh, saw that. Yeah. Yeah. That's my future. Right. And you're an amazing storyteller. The, well, thank you. Your book was was great. I, let me ask you this. Are you a Patriots fan? A Boston Patriots? Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, I, I went to school there. But that was pre-Patriots. I was in okay. school pre pre dynasty. Yes. Uh, okay. I was gonna, I'm from Burlington, Vermont, so my whole family's all Patriots fan, and they're there you know go. heavily is written in Boston, chopped or you know it takes right. place in Boston. And I was reading you know some of the your stuff on Wikipedia, and it seems you have a New England. Um, I do, I, and I have a son who lives in Boston now, and I have a son who lives in Providence, Rhode Island. So nice. we are still a New England oriented family. Oh, I love that. I love that. So there. What was your favorite movie to make? What is your favorite one of all of them? Um, I would probably say my favorite one to make was set, was uh, A Midnight Clear because mm -hmm. it was a bunch of young actors. We were very united in the same goal. I mean, I had a great experience making Set It Off mm -hmm. uh, in Los Angeles, but that was an action movie that we had to make on a low budget. That was the most yeah. stressful film I made. Really? Because we were just fighting the budget all the time and trying to do these big action sequences with Queen Latifah and Jada Pinkett. I mean, yeah. it was it was a challenge. And honestly, it was a challenge being a white producer on an all black film with a black director. <laughs> I you know? imagine. I, mean, I did want to ask about that. Yeah, you, you, you couldn't escape what it looked like. I had a very collaborative relationship with F. Gary Gray. And mm -hmm. so together, I felt, I mean, you know, he would bring me back. He, he didn't feel the dialogue was black enough. So he wanted <laughs> to work on the dialogue and he would give me dialogue and I would try to make it work for the script. So we ended up in a very collaborative relationship. And look, that film launched his career. Right. There's no straight out of Compton without set it off. Right. So right. He benefited greatly from Set It Off. I'm very happy he did. I think he's a, an immensely talented filmmaker who's gone mm -hmm. on, you know, to do really good movies. Yeah. So absolutely. I would say, you know, that was that was gratifying in terms of all the effort we put into led to success. That film cost eleven million dollars. The gross is now up to eighty two million. Wow. Yeah, nice. So I mean, it was set it off as a big movie when I was a kid. Yeah, and it's screened still all the time yeah. on Fox and BET. It's nice. one of the most popular black film titles of all time. Yeah. So it's gratifying to know that I made a movie that's had that kind of impact in a community. Right. Yeah. So that, and then the very first film I did called The Beast was directed by Kevin Reynolds before he went on to do Robin Hood and Waterworld. Um, okay. And I think he's actually the single best director I ever worked with. I think mm -hmm. he is a great American filmmaker. I feel very honored that I got to make his second feature film. And it's a film, if you go back and watch it today, it's even more powerful than when we made it because of history. We made a pro Mujahideen movie, pro, a pro Islamist terrorist movie, because they yeah. were fighting the Russians. Nineteen eighty. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're not so terrorists in that respect. You right. know, twenty years later, we're fighting them. But at yeah. the time we made the movie in nineteen eighty-seven, it was a really audacious film. Columbia Pictures dumped it. They oh. wanted nothing to do with it. It was too political for them. Yeah. And they actually, we got an invitation from the Moscow Film Festival, and Columbia <laughs> would not let us take the movie. Really? Yeah. They thought that... it would be bad press for them that we had a film that played well in Moscow. And it was just <laughs> ridiculous. We made a film about the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. So there were frustrations like that. But those three films, Midnight Clear, Set It Off, and The Beast are the three best films I've made. The Beast one, that's the one about um, 
what we were just talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, Afghanistan. Yeah, the movie. I do want to watch that one. Yeah. I watched Set It Off last night, and I started watching. Which one was it? Oh, a Midnight. No, there's another one. I started yeah, watching Midnight some Clear of them. Midnight Clear is hard to find. As is the Beast. Yeah, I couldn't find a bunch of them. Or Mrs. Winterborn. That's what I started watching. Yeah, Brendan that, Fraser's it, in that. You know, that was a, a great script. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the studio had a deal with Ricky Lake. They <laughs> did the talk show. Yeah. So we were told. Ricky. We were told Ricky Lake's going to star in your movie, and if you don't want Ricky Lake to star in it then you, you won't make your film. Huh. So, you know, Richard Benjamin, the director, and I had to look at each other. We were two years preparing the script for Mrs. Winterborn, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it was all going to go away if we didn't take Ricky Lake. Ricky Lake. So we in took it? Ricky Lake, and I, look, I think yep. she gives <laughs> the best performance of her film career, which is not too notable. I was going to say uh, her only performance, maybe. <laughs> well, no, she's in. She's in. What was the John Waters film? Um, Hairspray. She's in Hairspray. Oh, she's okay. pretty good Fair in enough. Hairspray, but yeah. she didn't carry Hairspray as the star. She right. was the star of Mrs. Winterborn. Yeah, and that just really wasn't in her dramatic makeup. No. <laughs> yeah, okay. That, that was a challenge for her. So the movie didn't no. do too well, I imagine. No. Film did not do very well because there was no film audience that wanted to see Ricky Lake. And unfortunately, when we made Mrs. Winterborn, the best person in the movie is Brendan Fraser. And we were before George of the Jungle or any of his big hits. Yeah, he's a young Brendan Fraser in that one. You also had a young Paul Walker in one of your movies, Mm -hmm. right? Beat the Deedles, his very first film. Yeah. A completely forgettable film, except for the performance of Paul Walker. Well, that so Meet the Deedles, uh, Set It Off, I've heard of in House of Cards. Like, I all remember from the 90s. Like, I don't remember watching Meet the Deedles, but I remember the name. Um, yeah, you had, to just, watch, it, you had to be really quick to watch it in the theater. It was... <laughs> and they... It's depressing, but it's a reality. Disney never even released it on a DVD. Really? No, they where did you, a VHS. Where do you find it now? <laughs> you can find it maybe on the Disney Channel, possibly. Well, it's probably on their streaming even, app now. They never did a DVD release of it, which was pretty amazing. Yeah, why is that? Because... Didn't do enough in the director, theater? The director was a stunt director. Yeah. I was brought on to the film. Everything was already set. My job was to help him direct the best movie he could direct. And I yeah. have to admit, I didn't do a good job of that. No, because now I got to so, watch that now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's funny is it does have a, a part for Dennis Hopper. Yeah. Dennis Hopper is one, you know, one of the great characters in American movie history. My yeah. little Dennis Hopper story was we hired him. We sent him the, the script. He had, I think, four days of work in the film. And, um, and we agreed to fly him up. We were shooting in Park City, Utah. We agreed to fly him up to the Sundance Resort, put him and his family up for the week that he would be here. Yeah. And um, the night before he's ready to start, he comes to the set and comes up to me because I had met him when we made the offer. The director Mm -hmm. actually had never even met him. He was just going on the (laughs) reputation of Dennis Hopper. So Dennis Hopper (laughs) comes up to me and says, "Um, so what's the film about? And I said... (laughs) Well, you read the script, right? He went, no, I don't read the scripts anymore. Wow. All right. So I said, well, do you know your lines? You know, do you know, do you know your part? He said, oh, yeah. I said, I do that every day. I memorize the day's work and I do it that day. Huh. And he said, I've got my assistant. He runs lines with me. And I, don't worry, I'll know exactly what I'm doing. Wow. But I said, you really took this film? without ever reading the script? He went, yeah, <laughs> I do that all the time. So what that if you were a serial killer, killer or something? <laughs> that was unique. I never, and, and you know, he's fine in the movie. He, he never yeah. fumbled for a line. So his system worked. But that wow. was the biggest, I think the biggest shock I ever got a producer was an actor coming up to me the night before he started work and telling me that he had never read the script. <laughs> and then come out the next day and record all his parts with no problem. Exactly. No problem. He's built different. <laughs> yes. Yep. 
Yeah. That's awesome. And there was an also like a when I was reading the book and I I know I've set it off and I think there's another movie I was looking through. There's kind of like a social justice theme in the background. Does that come from anywhere? Or was that just a creative? No, I, I think it comes very much from the person I was shaped to be by my parents, who were okay. very religious and very ethical in their own way. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my dad was upset when he thought I was going into Hollywood because he thought it was a really bad place filled with bad people who would, you know, not honor contracts and would try to screw you. He had been in the record business briefly as a mm -hmm. salesman and he didn't like the record business. So when <laughs> I went to work for a record label that had yeah. a film company, he was even more distrustful. And I was drawn <laughs> to stories that are about social justice in a way. And mm -hmm. as I look back on the films I made, I think there's really a theme there. It's yeah. even in films like The Mighty Quinn with Denzel Washington and okay. in A Home of Our Own with Kathy Bates, where she's a single mother with six kids. And at the beginning of that movie, there mm -hmm. is a scene of sexual abuse in the workplace. And yeah. her boss tries to, to, to touch her inappropriately. And she hits him and she's fired. And that was very real when we were making those films in the 90s. Yeah. So every film I made, from plays to Home of Our Own to House of Cards to Set It Off, has social justice as a theme in there somewhere. And so I'm really impressed and pleased that you picked that out from my body of work, because I, I was never drawn to just making a film for entertainment. I nice. wanted my movies, and even in the most subtle way, to say something, right. to make some comment about the human condition, because that's what I think good art does. That's why you relate to it. It says something about the condition that you can relate to in some way. Yeah, that's what I, I agree with that completely. What I try to do in all my movies. Um, it's what I'm going to try to do. It could be even film. unintentional. I think like when you feel powerful, like I'm an artist too, like I create things and I don't necessarily intend to put messages in my art, but they show up, you know, things I'm going through show up no matter what. Yeah. And that seems like one of those scenarios because it, it spans kind of your whole career. And yes, I just so. read your newest book. So, <laughs> and, and it wasn't something where I said, all right, now I'm going to make a movie or I'm going to write a book about how unclear the truth is. Right. I didn't realize how unclear the truth was till I wrote Chopped. Right. Until I had to think about what would this guy really do? How would this woman really react to these circumstances? Yeah. So, you know, I found it wasn't what I planned, but I found that it happened. Now I'm more conscious of it. And my next book deals very explicitly with race. Okay. And that's a very charged subject right now particularly yeah. for an older white writer to tackle, mm -hmm. right? But I'm excited about it. I'm excited about going into the somewhat dangerous waters. Yeah. Because I've got a great story. It needs to be told. I've got a way of telling it. And I'm not going to shy away from writing about race in contemporary America. Yeah. Because I can write about it very effectively in the past. Yeah. And have people draw their own conclusions. You were you were very effective in writing about it. It's a dicey, it's kind of like walking a tightrope, I imagine, as a white as a white man writing about anything having to do with slaves or, or black right. you know, and black I very culture. purposely introduced the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist yeah. movement into CHOP because I yeah. wanted to give that perspective. I wanted I to love that perspective. something other than just the white universe. I also right. tried, you know, the Irish were a very picked on minority. So yeah, I picked that up a lot too. They, they, yeah. to that, to me, the book had the Irish people and the, and the black people kind of in the same, yes. in the same boat. And what I, what I found really great about the book is you really captured, at least in my mind, even if you made it up, the, the way people talked and treated each other of that time. Cause that's, you know, it was in the 1840s, 1850s time period. And I think you captured, when I read it, I didn't feel like I was reading a book that was written this century. I felt like I was reading a book from those times it was actually written. And it was, it was great. I really enjoyed well, it. Thank you. I, I really worked hard on, on that. And I'm I doing it again in my next novel, 
which is set in 1918, right okay. at the end of World War One, and right in the middle of the influenza epidemic. Yeah. So uh, it, there should be elements that contemporary readers can really identify with in this book. So when I when I met you, um, you were talking about writing the book of Chalk and how it took what seven years or something like that. Well, can you take me through actual, why? And the whole process was 22 years oh, from man. the time we first conceived of trying to write it as a novel to the mm -hmm. time we actually published it. Um, a number of those, all those years, I was working a full-time job. So whatever <laughs> I did, I was doing in my free time. Yeah, and, at night. Yeah, and, and it became you know, pretty clear to me um, from the very beginning of CHOP that you know, it was going to be a tough sell for a first-time novelist. Period. Historical fiction is not. I don't the know. Most... I couldn't tell that was your first novel. I like. I couldn't tell that was the first time anything. Well, that was you. very well written. <laughs> well, it's because I did twenty-two drafts, and <laughs> and this was my wife as my editor being very tough and reading, yeah. and it was a big read every time, a big slog, and she would turn to me and say, "You know what? You can do better." So I would go back <laughs> oh, and and cut and cut. And I mean, there are some changes I maybe wish I hadn't made. I, some people find it difficult to get into the story because I mm -hmm. set up the three most important characters at the beginning, George Parkman, John Webster, and James Winchell Stone. Mm -hmm. The original beginning of, I had of the book, where the book began, was the night that they discovered the remains. And James Winchell Stone is hustled out of bed and brought that, that makes in, sense. boom, you were right there in the action. Okay. And sometimes I wish I had stuck with that opening, but I did listen to the feedback I got. And the feedback I got was, we don't understand the characters well enough. We don't understand the setting. We mm -hmm. don't understand that we're in 1850 Boston. So I went back and, and did what I had been advised to do, which was set up the three main characters. Right. Um, that's about the only change I question that I made. Um, writing draft after draft was a great education for me in a writer, as a writer. Yeah. And being forced to know, cut, cut, get rid of all the adverbs in the book. Literally. <laughs> all I went of through them. and tried to get rid of every adverb. Okay. And, and it was things like that, learning how to become a good fiction prose writer all right and i do think that my years in the movie business and my years as a film critic and just watching as many as films as i've watched made my writing a little more cinematic i i think yeah. my writing has some visual power that's a good way to describe it that's what it felt like a movie because in the beginning when you were setting up the characters i think that's correct like i i didn't get super into it but there's a point in the book at all times i'm like oh yeah this that was in the beginning now i now i know why so i think it worked out perfectly well thank you in the, thank for you. the story yeah. yeah and it it's just you know writing the best writing is rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and then coming to a point where you know you have to stop you know you can't rewrite the thing forever right and that was also where having my wife as my partner in this she's the publisher she basically has done everything to make the book actually happen. And she mm -hmm. was a very good editor for me and kept pushing me to do better. Uh, nice. and, and I think that's why the book reads the way it, it reads now. I'm proud of it. Uh, and the next book will be better because she'll push me on that book too. <laughs> so, you know, Does that it's cause any conflict you, in the relationship. Well, when you can take that conflict, the relationship and use it creatively, that's a great, that's a great thing. So, you know, look, we've been married for 50 years. So we're partners in a lot of different ways. But yeah. her partnership in this book was critical. I, nice. I honestly, I don't think I could have done this all by myself. I needed nice. support. I needed encouragement. I needed someone to be tough with me and to say, no, you can do this better. So the process was really very good for us and for our relationship. And nice. you can say that after 50 years, that's pretty good. I really admire that, that you guys can have a, a working relationship and also collaborate on a creative project. Is she yeah. just a super creative person also? Yes, but in very different ways. She's a mu musician. 
And she's a oh. very, very talented musician. She plays fiddle. Okay. She can play piano. She can play uh, uh, the tin flute. She can play a lot of different instruments. But nice. her creativity is in music. But yeah. creativity is creativity. Right. And, and, and that was the key thing that linked us on this project. I think if you can think creatively, it's a thing. You either you can do it with everything, right? Right. Yep. Versus not being creative at all. And yeah, as long as someone Absolutely. is creative, you can collaborate. <laughs> yes. Yep. So that the story of Chop is a true story, but the book you wrote is it, you made some parts up, right? Right. Well, every character in the book is real, except mm -hmm. for the Irish characters who I invented. Uh, you know, um, like Ellen's her, dad, Irish, her father, Ellen her father, the other Irish characters. Yeah. Everybody else is real. And I read a lot of writing of the period. I read the okay. early novels that were written in the early 1800s in America. I read a lot of prose from that period. So I had mm -hmm. a good idea of how people spoke and how literally they constructed their sentences and yeah. used certain formal language. Uh, and then it was just really immersing myself. What did people wear? What did they eat? Uh, yep. where, how did they amuse themselves? What time did they get up in the morning? When did they go to bed? You were using their like? slang. They were using Living their the slang world, terms and like, stuff. By candlelight. You know, right. whale oil was just beginning to come in as a substance for illumination. Right. Well, there are so many things were just happening in that 1845 to 1850 period. You know, the fact that any reporter could cover the murder trial and then go telegraph his, yeah. his story. That That's crazy. wouldn't happen five That's years crazy. ago. <laughs> right. That happened just in 1850. That's so crazy. there were so many things historically that happened in the period of my story that mm -hmm. I was able to really immerse myself in 19th century America and yeah. learned that people ate so much in those days. So many they, people were heavy that we think, oh, no, no, no. Americans are just heavy now. No, no, yeah. no. Back in 1850, you had people who were seriously overweight because mm -hmm. they overate. It's always been a problem. <laughs> six courses in a dinner, no problem. Yeah, that's so, not good. Uh, it was fun doing that. It's so different from our time. Right. And now I'm doing the same thing. I'm immersing myself in 1918 in North Carolina, where my mm -hmm. story is set. I'm nice. really trying to get a sense of what was it like to be alive in 1918 North Carolina. It's exactly what I did. With what was it alive to be alive in 1850 Boston? So when that consists of just changing. reading books of the time, right? Eating food yes. of the time. Finding it, doing research. Research. I mean, I consulted more than a um, hundred books on this subject, including mm -hmm. the six nonfiction books written about the Parkman Webster murder. Six yeah. different. Nobody had dealt with it fictionally, so that was my opportunity. Okay. So I read novels of the period. I read histories of the period. I found timelines of the period. Yeah. I talked to the costume designers at the School of the Arts. So I would be able to describe the wardrobe accurately using right. the proper 19th century terms for the wardrobe. Yeah. So it was little <laughs> elements like that that I used, I hoped, and I was glad it worked for you, that you felt you were back in that time. Yeah, absolutely. You were in the era of my story, because yeah. that was really important to me. Immersion. I wanted yep. to immerse the readers in this world. Yeah. I did, even if I said that earlier, even if you made it up, like I couldn't tell the difference. Like, you know, you could have totally just made up how that scene is and that's how I felt it should be, you know? It was really important for me that it be real. That's great. It, it was. tied to reality. You know what, there was something else I picked up on, or maybe it's just me, but your wife's last name is O'Keefe? Yes. So are you James? And uh, no. okay. I, I mean, I'm James in a certain sense. Yeah. Um, and I did use my wife's um, name, but actually Ellen is based on more on one of my daughter's friends who was okay. named Ellen and had a right. very distinctive personality. 
Yeah. So I used her name and a lot of her personality. I had a visual of this amazing woman from the 1850s who was one of the the first American female photographer. Her the name first? was Emery. Okay. And she was the first woman to use the new science of photography. And she <laughs> had this great look and this mane of red hair. Mm -hmm. And that's what I used as my model for Ellen. Okay. I yeah. like that. So did, based did, on did very the, real character. The the phonography uh, stuff in there, was that true? Like it was just coming out? And was it part of the actual trial? It was. And okay. we had people... There was actually, this is pretty strange. There was very little real source material on the real James Winchell Stone. Mm -hmm. I could find his name in the Boston directories as a doctor. I could go and find out his Harvard career at the Harvard Library in the alumni section. But in terms of what was he really like, we had to simply invent that. Okay. And so he's a little bit of me. He's a little bit of my wife's father, who was also a, a stone, you know, okay. and so there was some stuff, but mostly I just saw him as a second person, not me. I didn't write him for, from a first person. That's why I, I, I don't, I didn't want to use first person narration. Yeah. He's an objective character of the book. He's third right. person like everybody else in the book. And I wanted to keep him that way, yeah. but he is my protagonist. <laughs> he is my eyes and ears. So right. I did have to give him a personality not dissimilar from my own in yeah. terms of his curiosity. So you could keep he him familiar while know, you're writing? He wants to know more about everything. And that's right. kind of who I am as a writer. I want to know more about everything in this world. Yeah. And so I tried to make him an extension of me in that regard. Okay. But he's also, what was so interesting, and you don't realize this until you write fiction for the first time, your characters do develop a mind of their own. He did yeah. things that surprised me <laughs> as I wrote. Them. And yeah. that was, you know, when I was writing about George Lucas and Skywalking, I didn't have that freedom. I had yeah. to stick to what George Lucas said or what I said. But in Stick writing, Trump, I had the freedom to right. make him both real historical and also someone different from me. Have fun with him, right? Yeah. And that's so interesting when you say, yeah. well, I might have done this, but my character decided to do that. Well, you could play with your fantasy, right? Like, like I would totally do this in this situation, but, you know, James would want to do something like this and then write that into exactly. the story. And, and boy, like that, that was that was really fun as a writer. Yeah. Giving him that freedom to be his own person and not have to just be an extension of me. I really like that. Yeah. I've been trying to write a couple books, but <laughs> I've never done it before. So we'll, we'll see well, how it goes. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough process, but I will tell you, hang in there. It's rewarding yeah. at the end. I hope so. But uh, part of, you know, why it makes me pause is originally my idea was to write a serial killer story based on one of my kids, but I'm worried about the fallout from that later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, like, don't Dad, worry you about think you. I'm a serial killer. Like, no, I don't. I love you. <laughs> just, just fictionalize more. That's all. Right. More fiction. That's right. maybe that's what I got to do. Yeah. What, what, why did you pick that story? The, the murder of George Parkman? Uh, well, because it was part of my wife's family history. Oh, I mean, it was stone. part of the family history that, to my wife's great great grandfather had mm -hmm. been this doctor in Boston, had a significant part in the biggest murder trial of the 19th century to that point, and huh. had published this book, the transcript of the trial that survived all the moves of the family. That survived huh. James Winchell Stone's widow, took the book with her to Italy, where her da one daughter married a count. And the mm -hmm. other daughter married a British army officer. And that daughter took the book back to England. And wow. from there, it ended up ultimately with my wife's mother, and then my wife, and then me. That's awesome. This was the document that inspired everything. There's no book without our having his original published transcription of the trial. 
The phonographic report? The phonographic report. Ha is it available for everyone to read? No. It's, it's way out of print. To my yeah. knowledge, there are only three copies. The one we have, the one the Harvard Medical School Library has, and yeah. the one the Harvard Law School Library has. Those Man. are the only three copies I'm aware of. That would be fascinating to read. <laughs> Why don't you but publish that and put the it testimony, out? All the testimony from the trial in my book comes mm -hmm. directly from his transcription. Okay. Word for word? Word for word. I didn't change nice. a word. That's a fascinating story. What's to stop you from uh, pr uh, printing that? It's written in a very nineteen mid-19th century way. Plus, yeah. he realized very quickly while he's sitting there in court trying to take down everything, that if he did the question of the witness, he would be late on the answer of the witness. So what he figured out, and it worked because I was able to use it, that the mm -hmm. question would be implicit in the answer. Okay. So where were you on the night of February 11th, right? Right. Rather than me, rather than him taking down that question, he would start out the witness by saying, I was at this place at 11 o'clock that night. So the question I could figure out. So when I'm writing the actual courtroom scenes, mm -hmm. I'm making up the things that the attorneys say, but I'm not making up a word of what the witness says. That's verbatim as okay. he took it down in the courtroom. And that right. was very important to me to stay true to the actual words of the witnesses. Right. And not invent what I wish they had said. <laughs> Don't be creative there. That's an I actual account. I didn't want account. to be creative there. I wanted yeah. to be accurate, historically accurate there. Right. You know, the, one of the questions I had, I couldn't really picture it in my head. So, you know, James is in there doing the photography, taking down. Right. How is he doing that? Is he writing symbols? Or is it He's a writing typewriter? Symbols with ink and you know pens with a nib on them and stuff so he's just going he's real writing fast. literally on a roll of parchment okay a scroll almost so he's turning it and writing he's it? turning it as he writes huh because otherwise he would have been a wash in paper and right. he couldn't do that in the middle of the courtroom he knew he couldn't yeah so he literally used a scroll of paper so he was the human data recorder Exactly. Rolling Being paper and effect, writing. The very first court reporter in history. Okay. What does the court reporter do? They take down everything that's said in the courtroom. Yeah, and they have symbols on their little uh, thing exactly. instead of letters. He had the same things. So, no kidding. That I think that is all fascinating. You know, just the and the apparently story of there was a guy. There was a guy who had tried to take down some procedure in Congress, some mm -hmm. kind of trial. And after two days, he, he gave up. It was too difficult. Yeah. The fact that James Winchell Stone stuck it out, took down the transcript of the entire two-week trial. Yeah. Then somehow, we have no idea. I had to make up how he dictated it to these young women who were the copyists. Because right. there's no record of how it went from the courtroom to his published version. So I had ah. to invent that. And so, so could have James, technically, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> that was our feeling. How else was he going to do it? He had to read it aloud to somebody. Yeah. So That's interesting. We gave, and, and that, of course, gave Ellen a pivotal thing to do in the story. Right. To be the means. He gave her a role to make sure able. that they, they work together, right? Exactly. And then they fell in and love. And she then? could oh. find all the young ladies to take down the dictation. Yeah. Well, that was a very fascinating story. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about, I didn't really touch on the uh, George Lucas biographies that you wrote. Right. When did those come out? Well, I was the very first person to do a biography of him. It came out in 1983, just before the release of Return of the Jedi. Oh, man. And um, it was very successful when it came out. It was serialized in Esquire in Life magazine, um, <laughs> uh, and um, was very well reviewed nationally and um, sold 150,000 copies. 
Wow. And to my amazement, is still in print now, 40 years after its original publication, people are still buying it. That's awesome. And what I discovered, and I can't believe I was this stupid, that I never did an audio book for right. Skywalking. So we're going to yeah. do one now. Okay, good. I'm going to have the audio book oh, come out of Skywalking. Did you know I produce audio books? I did not. I do that. I was I was going to mention that. I'm going to do an audio book for the author that I just uh, interviewed last week. Oh, great. I, we could do that if you ever, if you ever well, need someone. Well, I have a guy now up in, the guy who okay. did the audio book for Chop. Okay. Who I worked really well with. He's done about Oh, I couldn't find the auto, audio book for Chopped. I was trying to. Just, it's coming out. Oh, okay. In April. I recorded I like it myself. Oh, I love um, that. I'm going to fly up at the end of March to do the final changes, you know, replace okay. all my flubs. And then yeah. it will be available and uh, on Audible right nice. at the beginning of April. At the beginning of April? Yep. All right. So I'm very excited about that. I'll try to put that in the show notes. Yeah, and it was the first time I recorded an audiobook. I had no idea how yeah. I would do, but the guys who produced it were very pleased. And nice. um, and it was fun for me. I never yeah. read one of my books, right? <laughs> it's a very weird experience. And hearing your voice is probably weird, loud. right? Pardon me? Hearing your own voice, like your own work in your own voice probably feels yeah. weird. It does to me every time. Me too. I hate my voice. Yeah. But other people like tell me my voice is good, so I'll take their word for it. It is good, and I get the same thing, so I'm going to take their yeah. word for it as well. <laughs> yeah. You have a good voice also. <laughs> Thanks. When, when is your newest book coming out? Well, um, I'm hopeful the research. I know it will not take me 12 years to do the research. Uh, <laughs> and the fact that it's all where I live now is also makes it a whole lot easier. So yeah. I'm hopeful that this book will be out in either late 2025 or early 2026. Okay. So I'm really hopeful next year. Nice. I would love the opportunity to read that book as well when it comes out and get you back I on and talk about sure it. I will make sure you do. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Um, wh where can uh, everyone, my listeners, find you at on your social? Uh, DaleMpollock.com. D-A-L-E-M-P-O-L-L-O-C-K.com. Okay. That's my website, and right. uh, it's very Are active. Are you on any socials? Um, I do. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. Facebook and LinkedIn? Yep. Okay. And I can Instagram. put our uh, wife does all my Instagram postings. Is she your social media director? And that wraps up another insightful episode of Almost Above Average with Chris McIntyre. A huge thank you to our special guest today, Dale Pollack, the brilliant mind behind Set It Off, the movie. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as we did. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave a five-star review. And please check in for more engaging conversations with exceptional individuals like Dale. Until next time, stay curious, stay inspired, and stay almost above average.